Our next author, before I bring him up, he wanted me to make sure the mood was way more sullen than jokey time. So I wanted to remind you guys that most of the world doesn't have clean drinking water. So just think about that. When I bring up Mike Cole, everybody. I feel like I'm on late night. Um, I think my relationship with Twitter can be best summed up by um, when I first started using it, there was an account, and it was some kid, I think, in the Midwest who said, uh, I wish my washing machine had sh would shut up. And in 30 seconds, someone had created a Twitter account that said, the washing machine, that was titled The Washing Machine, and tweeted back, no, you shut up. <laughs> And I knew, I knew I was in love with the medium. Um, I want to ask you guys uh, all to follow my friend Sam Sykes. Uh, he's also a writer. Uh, his Twitter feed is at Sam Sykes Swears, S-A-M-S-Y-K-E-S-S-W-E-A-R-S. -E -S -S. He encapsulates everything I love about Twitter and that he makes absolutely no sense and spends most of his time, as I was in the green room waiting for to come out here, he tweeted at me, I work in law enforcement, what is Mike Cole doing to keep us safe from the Hamburglar? You can, um, to, his, to his currently 8,419 followers. Um, so uh, I hope you'll join that number to get more of, of what I love about Twitter. So I'm really glad I'm following a comedian and that I'm gonna be followed by a comedian because I'm gonna read you a <clears throat> post-Holocaust scene um, from a novel I wrote that's extremely down-tempo. Just to bring you guys up to speed, it's from the point of view of a, of a young 13-year-old girl who's just been involved in an event called a knitting. A knitting is, um, in this universe, magic is illegal, and anywhere it, it is, its presence rears its ugly head, a religious organization called the Order comes and eradicates it by killing everyone who comes in contact with it. And they enlist the help of local villages. So this girl has just been part of a knitting line. She's had to be part of a group that surrounded a village and eradicated every living thing. Um, and she's come back. It's over. She's obviously deeply, deeply affected by the event. And uh, we're going to see her reaction to it. Um, so bear with me. So it's chapter three. We didn't have to do it. The sun was beginning to rise when another pilgrim stumbled wearily out of the drifting smoke and dismissed them with a wave. No more people were driven their way. There was a scream here and there, but most of the night was standing in silence, squinting through the drifting ash and boiling smoke. They climbed back into the cart, exhausted, eyes down. It was silent for the jostling ride back, the same look on every face. Exhaustion mostly, but also something that looked like shame. No one spoke of the dog who had escaped or of the girl who hadn't. Ingemar's talk of protecting El Waz was done. He looked steadily between his knees, tears making lines through the soot covering his face. Samson's brow was furrowed, his cheeks purple. He didn't talk about his fight with the brother tongue, and El Waz knew it would be unwise to bring it up. El Waz wanted to shout at them, at herself, this is our fault. We did this. Had to be done, Samson said. I told Joran to shut that simpleton up. Elwaz didn't realize he was speaking to her until Luba put a hand on her, his shoulder. Husband, it had to be done, Samson repeated, cutting her off. You have to remember that. A knitting is a terrible thing, but the devils are worse. The emperor did it for us once, and now it's for us to do it for ourselves. That's our strength, his gift to us. It didn't feel like a gift. Churik was simple, he wasn't a wizard. If even one had gotten through, Samson tapped Ingemar's knee, though the boy showed no sign he noticed. It could have been worse. And what about Kali, Helwas thought. Adults always told lies, not just to her, but to themselves. And worst of all, they expected her to repeat them, to act as though up was down of her own free will. It was a stupid, wicked way to live, and the smoke still smudging the darkening sky showed how it ended. It had to be done, her father said straightening and looking away. But the words had an upward lilt at the end, like he was asking a question. At last, the cart rocked to a stop, and Elwaz looked up to see them back on the village common. Her arms and legs felt like they'd been filled with metal. She sat as the cart slowly emptied, her parents slumping to the ground. Samson turned back to Elwaz. Come on, girl. Elwaz wasn't ready to move yet, her mind still whirling. Leave her, Sigir's voice. I'll send her along in a moment. Elwaz heard her father hesitate, then grunt assent. 
her parents' steps dwindled in the distance, and still Elwaz sat, feeling the cart rock as the people left, until suddenly it was still, and she knew she was alone. Come on, child, Sigir said from the ground beside her. The grief in his tone was honest, and it gave her the strength to stand. The mayor looked tiny from his place beside the cart, as thin as the poles they'd carried, his ash-streaked face shadowed by the growing darkness, eyes bruised-looking from exhaustion. He held up a skinny hand. Come down now. It's over. Papa says we had to do it, Elwaz said. He says if we hadn't, the devils would have come. Sigir said nothing as she shook, took his hand and jumped down to the ground. She looked up at him, saw the horror on his face, the deep lines the day's events had cut in him. Adults lied, but Elwaz didn't think he would just now. Did we have to do it, she asked. No, he answered, his voice breaking, tears falling into his beard to turn the flakes of ash to gray slush. No, child, we didn't. Elwaz thought she could feel, should feel angry at his words, but when she searched her heart, she could find only fatigue. Then why did we? Because they would have killed us if we refused, he answered, because it would have been our village, our fields, our families they knit. Why us? If they're so worried about wizard blight, they can use the army. Sigurd shook his head. The army has other tasks. This work falls to the order. He took a deep breath, then spoke again. And making us complicit means we are more likely not to call them to account for the crime. But what if we fought them? Papa hit that pilgrim in the face, and, and I hit him in the boot with a stone, though no one saw. Your father is very brave, and he loves you very much. And I pray that he will not be made to pay for that. It is one thing for a man to fight another man. It is another for a village of men to try to stop the might of the order. But we have tip staffs and the tinkers have what? He covered her mouth with his hand, not roughly, just enough to stop her speaking. His palm smelled like smoke and burned meat. We have both spoken heresy today. And that's a dangerous thing, Elwaz. I'll answer your question and then we'll speak no more of this. And you have to promise me that you'll remember that while your thoughts are your own, the words you let past your lips belong to the world, and the world will not always take the meaning you intend. She nodded. Most men in this village fought in the old war. I knew your father then. He was a brave man and strong. He would fight like a lion to protect his home and hearth. But war also taught me odds. How many men and how many swords you need. How much time must be spent in the drill yard learning to hold a line to shore pikes and stand against a charge. We would lose, hell was. We would lose quickly and utterly, and the wages would be just as bad as a knitting, maybe worse. We are farmers and smiths and wheelwrights. The order speaks of ministry, but it is paint over the board. The wood beneath is killing. It is what they train to do. It is what they are equipped to do. It is all they do. They stood in silence for a moment, Sigurd slowly mastering his tears, at last, he brushed a lock of her hair back behind her ear and sighed. I am sorry, Elwaz. The world is not as I would have it. Go tell your father to come to me. We must decide what to do now. Elwaz turned to go, but Sigurd called her back. Remember, never to speak of what was said here tonight. The pious might take it amiss, and we will have enough trouble with what your father has done. He left her then. And the world that had been so full of smoke and flame and screaming was replaced by the cool night, stars beginning to show in the waning, the soft, warm glow of the hearth coals dancing in the windows of her home. Thank you. My call, my call.